Now, last week uh, was our official friend day, and I'm so glad that we have more friends here today. Uh, and on friend day, we wanted to, I wanted to take opportunity to talk a little bit from the Bible about what biblical friendship looks like. Uh, obviously, it's it, two weeks is not an exhaustive sermon series on uh, friendship in Scripture. But I wanted to highlight examples of two individuals that really stepped up to provide great examples of biblical friendship. And last week, we took time to focus in on a man named Ananias. Now, when the Apostle uh, Paul, or at that time as he was known, Saul, uh, when he met Jesus on that road to Damascus, he was a hater of God. He hated Christ. He hated everything about the church. He hated uh, anybody who followed Christ, this thing called the way. He, he despised them. So now we're in this situation where uh, he is completely uh, dumbstruck, knocked off his high horse, knocked to the ground by the blinding light and the, the voice of Jesus Christ himself speaking to him. And he experiences this conversion where he goes from being hater of God to lover of Christ. But he's blinded. He doesn't know yet what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a friend of God, what it means to be a part of God's family, what it means to live out your life as obedient to Jesus Christ. That's when God sends Ananias. Ananias comes along lays his hands on Saul and says to him, Brother Saul, I've been sent that you may believe and receive your sight. And he does. He receives his sight back. He receives a filling of the Holy Spirit. He's baptized and he becomes a part of God's family. Now, it doesn't end there. God doesn't just leave Saul out there hanging, but he provides yet again another friend. So in the first friend that God provided, we see a friend who stood by Saul and helped him during his difficult times. We all need that, don't we? We go through ups and downs in life. We are at mountain's peak one day, and then the next day we can come crashing down to the valley because life is difficult and challenges have come our way. We need people with us in the valley. And that's what Ananias was, and I would submit to you, that's what the church of Christ is to be, people in the valley. But it's not just that kind of friend that God provides. A true faithful friend not only stands by you during the difficult times, but will challenge you and encourage you to be something more in your life. There needs to be people in your life. Let me see if I can put this in easy to understand figurative language. You need people in your life who sometimes kick you in the pants and move you forward for Jesus. The Bible calls this discipleship. It's when somebody lovingly encourages you, walks with you, and moves your life forward to be more for Christ. That is a true biblical friend. And God provided such a person to Saul. The man's name was Barnabas. There's maybe, in my opinion, no greater example in Scripture than this man. His name wasn't originally Barnabas. It was Joseph. Um, but you probably know him as Barnabas because he had a certain reputation about him that he gained the nickname Barnabas. And here's where it comes from. I'm going to read this with you so you can know what kind of man we're dealing with, and then we're going to pray. Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, we get a glimpse into why he is who he is. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money um, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the many people that you provide in our life. 
We thank you for, first and foremost, providing the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest relationship we have, the most wonderful friend we will ever experience. No greater love has a man than that he lay down his life for another. To think that the creator of all heaven and earth, the Son of God, the ruler of everything and sustainer of all things, would lay down his life for me is overwhelming. God, I thank you for that great friend that we have in Jesus. And I thank you that you provide friends in so many other ways, especially through this church body. Believers who come alongside us, put their arms around us, sometimes even carry us, say difficult things to us, challenge us when we need to be challenged, push our buttons when we're not listening, and who tell us that we're loved no matter what. We all need friends like that. I pray that you speak to us today through your word and through the great example of this man, the son of encouragement. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I see Barnabas here, and uh, he seems to be a, a man of reputation. Um, early on in the church, uh, the apostles who, you know, the apostles are the ones who were walking daily with Jesus. They were hearing daily the teachings of Jesus. They were seeing the miracles firsthand. They had experienced the encouragement that Jesus had provided and the nourishment that came from him in their life. And now they meet this man, Barnabas, and there's something about this guy's life that the apostles say to themselves, we don't need to call this man Joseph. We need to give him another name. We need to call him the son of encouragement. Could you imagine if the apostle Peter had looked at you in your life and said, you know what's most telling to me about you? is that you are an encourager. And that's what I'm going to call you from now on. Jesus called me the rock. I'm going to call you the encourager. I think that's totally awesome. That your reputation is so strong that the apostles of Jesus Christ himself would want to change your name to encourager. That is cool. I want that on my business card. I want it to say, I want it to say Larry Snyder, the encourager. Right? Because who wouldn't respond to that? Everybody needs that. Everybody. And, and then even in this verse, we learn something else about this man. Before we even get to the points for today, look, look, it says in verse 37, he sold a field that belonged to him and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This guy was like, whatever's going on for the kingdom, whatever you guys think is best as the leaders of the church, Whatever the mission is, if it's for Jesus, I'm all in. And by the way, I'm going to go take this large asset that I have, I'm going to sell it off, and you take the money and you do whatever think is, you think is best for God. Here it is. Lay it at your feet. It's yours, Peter. You do what you want with it. We get a bad example after this guy. and Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they didn't do it so well, um, and they ended up dead. But when it comes, but Barnabas apparently did it well, and he ended up with a nickname because he was all in for Jesus, and he was going to make sure that every life he touched knew what it meant to be all in for Jesus as well. Is that you as a follower of Christ? Are you so all in for Jesus that everybody who bumps up and rubs against you, they want to be like you? They want to experience what you're experiencing in your life. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's who Barnabas was. And that's my, that's my first point. If we want somebody, a friend, who's going to lead us deeper, and when I say deeper, I mean deeper for Jesus, because that's the only deeper that really matters. If, if, if you want a friend who's going to lead you deeper, deeper means that they themselves um, have been there. Point one, deeper means they've been there themselves. You can't take somebody to a place where you've never been. So Barnabas had this reputation, and he now received the name of encouragement. So Joseph was his name, encouragement was his game. 
as the church grew tighter and as the church grew larger, he put his faith into action. And that meant even his financial treasure. We don't know how big the field was. We don't know how much money it cost him, how much money he gave, because that's not the way God operates. God didn't need any of Barnabas's money. Uh, he owns the cattle on 10,000 hills, according to Scripture. But what we can tell by this, based upon Barnabas' reputation, is that he went all in when he did it. He wasn't holding back. He gave his best. So he put his faith into action. I would just submit to you this morning, it is so important in your life that you connect with friends who have been farther along in their faith for Christ and have been farther along in their commitment to Christ. Because when I, when Saul comes along, he hasn't met Barnabas yet at this point in Acts chapter 4. But the Barnabas that he's going to meet is a guy who, when Saul comes to a place in his life where God calls him to difficult things, calls him to big things of faith, Barnabas is there to say, you know what? God's asked some pretty heady things of me too. Let me tell you how it went down. God called me to, to do this. God called me to go there. God called me to serve here. God called me to give this up. God called me to suffer in this way. And when you have somebody in your life who's been a little farther down the road, it makes a world of difference, doesn't it? When you lose a child, uh, or let's say you've, been, you've gone through a miscarriage in your life, sometimes the only people that can speak to you in that time of hurt are people who have also lost a child. You can just see it on somebody's face. You know a person who's lost a child. You know it. And when somebody else who has gone through that or is going through that stops and turns around and takes you by the hand and says, come on, let's do this together. Wow. And apparently that's the reputation Barnabas had. It's important to connect with friends who've been farther along. As Saul developed in his passion for Christ and his calling, God was about to provide this man, Barnabas, in his life and use him in a very unique way. And I'm about to show you. Let's fast forward to Acts chapter 9. Now remember, Saul had just been baptized um, and was now a part of the church and he was figuring out his way in this new Christian life. And in verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. All right, so stop a second here. I just want to draw something to your attention. If you want to know how passionate this new believer was now, on getting the message out for Christ. Uh, he is still very early on in his ministry, very early on in his ministry, and already people want to kill him. This is going... Um, if, if, if Barnabas's calling card was the encourager, right? The, Paul's would say, the Apostle Paul, everybody wants me dead. Because it kind of seems that way. His whole entire ministry is either people wanting to throw him in the, in the pokey or to kill him. So already here, we see in, uh, in Acts 9, the same chapter in which he was saved, the Jews are plotting to kill him. Verse 24. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Now stop here a second. This, I'm giving you all free information here. As, as I'm reading the text again, God's showing me even more things. Look at verse 25. Whose disciples? His disciples. 
already early in his walk and in his service to the Lord, people are threatening to kill him and people are following him. That's how much power his message had. That's how quickly God ramped up his ministry. That's how much authority he had in what he was doing for God. It just This man is amazing. He's amazing the way God used him, and it's amazing to me the way God would lead him from one suffering to the next. He's, he's in desperate need of a Barnabas. Verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. (laughs) And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So here's my second thought, my second point this morning. Deeper means that those friends, they invest in your spiritual potential. They invest in your spiritual potential. The church throughout all history has been about one believer investing in the spiritual potential of another believer so that that other believer might grow and do greater things for Christ. We are all we've got, right? Like, the, the truths that I share with you hopefully spark in you greater spiritual potential, greater spiritual works. The things and examples that you all set for me in your daily life hopefully spark in me a desire and a hunger to do greater things for God. That's the way the body of Christ has always worked. So Saul left Jerusalem bent on destroying the church. Remember, he, last time he was in Jerusalem, he had been given papers, orders to go to Damascus and to humiliate, arrest, persecute, and kill the church in Damascus. Found Christ. Holy Spirit got a hold of his life. Started using him in amazing ways. Now, when he makes his first trip back to Jerusalem through the same gates that he left, He is preaching the gospel of salvation. Saul is at a point where his efforts for Christ are being met with one obstacle after another. This group of Judaizers wants to kill him. This group of Hellenists want to kill him. I don't know how bad your days are this week, how much you have to worry about this upcoming week, but I'm pretty sure that there aren't any hits out on your life. If there are people who have a hit out on your life, can you let me know? For two reasons. One, I don't want to stand too close to you. And two, I want to help you find help. Me and I watch too many crime shows. We know all the lingo. Saul, at this point, is is just being met by one obstacle after another. In some cases, it was the believers who were the problem. He wanted to connect with the the believers in Jerusalem, and the disciples were saying, no, this guy, bad reputation, not good. Stay away from him. Anathema. Let's let's just keep him out of our lives. They They were untrusting. They were fearful. And I get it. When he left Jerusalem... His job was to kill believers. So I kind of understand where they're coming from. There has been a history in the church of God saving people and bringing people who have no right to be in the church, bringing them into the body and folding them in because they are saved by the same grace that we are saved by. People who are 
covered in tattoos, people who have a history of smoking everything in the, and the kitchen sink, people who have shot up everything and the kitchen sink, people who have drank everything and the kitchen sink, people who have, have harmed others, people who have killed others. God has brought those people into the church in order that they might be saved and that they might have fellowship with us who are covered with tattoos, who have hated people in our own hearts and murdered them, who have, have struggled in, in our own sorts of lack of discipline in our life. We're just a bunch of hurt, messed up, forgiven people trying to help other messed up, hurt, and forgiven people. That's, I think, what they saw in Barnabas. I know that's what Barnabas saw in Saul. Because in the midst of all the obstacles that Saul was running up to against, Barnabas comes into his life and decides, mm, I'm going to link arms with this guy. I see spiritual potential in him. I see that God's using him. Look, uh, I, there have been a lot of people that have poured themselves into my life because they saw spiritual potential that I did not see in myself. And I'm so thankful for them. I saw myself as a polished sort of just not on a platform kind of person. I saw myself as somebody who just, you know, kind of maybe deserved to make a few bucks in life and, and move forward with no fanfare and to try not to screw anything up for Jesus along the way. And there, God has just for years put people in my life, particularly men, to say, nope, you're supposed to be doing more. No, you're supposed to be doing more. No, you're supposed to be doing more. Especially older men. And when I say older, I don't mean just a couple years older than me. I mean senior citizen men who God has used, especially when I was a teenager and a young adult who I looked at with reverence and they would all to a man, they, they loved Jesus and they kept telling me, you need to be doing more for Christ. So in the midst of all this, Barnabas chooses to do something really, really, really challenging. He leverages his connections with the apostles in order to make the necessary introduction to the people that matter. Paul had tried on his own to make this connection to no avail. The word here, now let me find it for you. It says, um, uh, in verse 26, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. That word attempted or tried is a pretty powerful word. The word for attempted or tried, um, it means repeatedly. So it was, uh, he didn't just try one time. He kept banging on the door in order to meet the apostles, and they would not have anything to do with him. Note, when Barnabas makes the introduction, he doesn't introduce him and say, hey, uh, you guys may remember Saul. Remember the guy who tried to kill us? Remember the guy that hated us? That's not the introduction he makes. Did you catch the introduction? He says, uh, uh, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So what Barnabas chooses to focus on with the apostles is the, the power that God is, is, is using in this man, the potential that God has for this man. When we look at other people and we speak of other people, is the focus always on the negative? Is the focus always on what's wrong with that person? Is the focus always on the challenges that they're going to face in their life? Or, or like good friends, are we looking at everybody in this body and saying, by the grace of God, they can do this. And by the grace of God, they can do that. I want to err on that side. I know that we're all screw-ups. I know that every day is a bad hair day for a lot of us. I get it. I understand that 
There are times where there are seasons of our life where we're going to take one step forward and two steps back. But I believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of you, God has great things. In and I'm standing up here as your pastor, but I'm, I'm, biblically, I believe I can speak that truth over your life. He has equipped each and every believer in Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and all the giftings that go along with that. And there are things you can do that I can't do. You think, well, I couldn't, I just couldn't stand up on Sunday morning or, and preach like that, or I could never teach, so I can't be a person of influence. That's not true. The very fact that some of you are Johnny on the spot right away when somebody's hurting, that's being a disciple. That's spiritual potential. That's being a Barnabas. So Barnabas speaks to his good reputation, all the things that Christ is doing in and through him. This is what a faithful friend does. Barnabas' belief and investment in Saul, it pays off. It pays off. Saul gets to spend 15 days with Peter learning. I don't know what he learned but uh, probably stories of teachings of Christ and time spent with Jesus personally. And he also gets the opportunity now to speak and preach Jesus in Jerusalem. I like how um, he doesn't just show up so that he could hang out in a Bible study class with Peter. He shows up for a Bible study class with Peter, and then the rest of the day, he goes out in the streets and he preaches Jesus to anybody who will listen. It's nice to go to Bible study. Great. But Bible study without application is pointless. we got to go. Point three. Deeper. When somebody takes you deeper, it means that God is glorified and lifted up. When one believer links arms with another believer and takes them to a deeper place in Christ, invests in that spiritual potential, God is glorified in that. One of the challenges of managing our friendships and our relationships is, the, is this. Now listen, we as human beings, we calculate, our in, we calculate our investment in somebody else based upon what we may or may not get out of that investment personally. Do I want to pour my life into somebody that I may not see anything personally as a result of that? That's not why we do it. We invest in other people, other believers, so that God is glorified in their life, and God gets all the return and the glory. Here, we learn that the greatest beneficiary of Barnabas' relationship with Saul was Christ himself. The persecutor of the church was now the greatest defender of the church. We know that every intelligent thinker across the ancient world could not hold a candle to the arguments of Paul when it came to the truth of the gospel of Christ. Saul now does what he does. And persecution comes his way. And the church experiences, this is the Bible's words, not mine, peace. It says, this is where what God says matters. Um, the Word of God says in verse 31, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. So Judea, I get that. Galilee, I get that. But what's this random third region that's thrown in here. Samaria? Are you telling me the region that was hated by the Jews more than anything is now experiencing 
peace and growth in Christ and multiplying? The church is multiplying in Samaria? Of course it is. Everywhere the gospel is preached, the church historically has experienced peace and has multiplied. And it also experiences its share of persecution. But among itself, when the church is on mission, the church is at peace. And God is glorified and lifted up. Point four. Deeper means that you're a friend calling on your friends to do God things. Your friends are the kind of friends who call on you to do God things. Not to sit in your barca lounger and just watch Jeopardy and read a few Bible verses every day. But you are surrounded by ardent believers in Christ who have been radically saved through the mercy and grace of Jesus that are now challenging you to go and do great things for Christ. Antioch was the third greatest city in the Roman world after only Rome and Alexandria. It was key to so many things, including cultural exchange, commercial exchange. It was also home to Hellenistic Judaism. Many Greeks and Gentiles found it as a great place to live. It's here in Antioch on account of the ministry of Stephen, the deacon, the martyr, and some believing Jews from his ministry that the church took hold to both Jews and Gentile believers alike. As this developed and reports trickled in to the leaders in Jerusalem, they began. the leaders of the church in Jerusalem began to hear, all right, so... We got a whole hodgepodge of people that are coming to Christ in Antioch. We got some Hellenistic Jews that are coming to Jesus. We have some Orthodox Jews that are coming to Jesus. We even got some crazy Gentile non Jews that are coming to Jesus. We're not really sure what to do with this information. So they decide to send somebody to check it out. Who do they send? Well, they sent Barnabas to go. In Acts 11, we read this account, verses 22 and onward. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. This place, Antioch, is on fire for the Lord the third largest city, third most prominent city in the Roman world, and it is on fire for Christ. Barnabas is sent by the apostles, the leaders of the church, to go. He's like, whoa, this is a good thing, but they need more. Who's the best person to come and teach these new believers here? Ooh, I know. I'll go go all the way to Syria. I'll grab my buddy Saul who's in Tarsus, I'll bring him down. I'll let him preach the gospel here and teach these believers. And that's exactly what they did. Again, we see the goodness and godliness of Barnabas' faith. A simple resume of three attributes that we should all be blessed to have. I don't know if you caught this, but again, it says in verse 24, for he was a good man. Boom full of the Holy Spirit, boom, and of faith, boom. Love to have those on my calling card.
His first thought on witnessing this amazing work of God was that they needed to be taught more, and Saul was the one to do it. He was going to call Saul to a deeper work. A, see, a faithful friend isn't just satisfied with seeing your potential. A faithful friend is the kind of friend who wants to watch God use you in real ways. This was the method of Christ, was it not? He didn't just preach to his disciples and tell them what they should do. He made sure that they went out and did it. In Mark chapter 6, And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is crazy. This, this testimony doesn't get enough attention. Do you realize that Jesus took these numbskull disciples who at this point in time knew enough to just be dangerous. And he, he said, all right, here's what's going to happen. You're going to do this. I want you to go and do this. They go out and they do it. In his power, they heal the sick. In his power, they call people to repentance. Cast out demons. Jesus understood that it wasn't good enough just to say somebody has potential. We want to see people utilize their potential. Why do we send people on a mission trip to Romania? Exactly. To see them used by God. Why does our outreach team meet here every Wednesday evening to pray for and to brainstorm reaching this community for Christ? Because we need to be a church that utilizes our potential. When I was newly married, like 24, I can remember our pastor calling me and asking me to start a Sunday school class. I'd never taught a thing in my life. Never even saw myself in that role in the church. I, I'd maybe taught a few things, like, you know, at work, somebody asked me to lead a you know, a briefing or a, a, an exercise at a leadership meeting or something. But I never started something like a Sunday school class, that's for sure. And I never called a Sunday school class my own. And I remember a newly married young adult in my church. Now, my pastor had asked me to do that. But the greater blessing is when I saw another adult in the church do it with my son. I remember a newly married young adult in my church asking my son, because he saw my son play the piano and he knew he was good at it. And he asked him if he would like to do a song with him to honor the Lord. So the two of them, he called, he made time. He, he picked up my son. They got together. They worked on their piano. And, and my son's like, you know, 12. And he's like 25. And uh, Orlando and my son, they just got together and they hammered out this song. And they played it as the first time my son ever performed during a worship service. And uh, God was glorified in that. But for me, it wasn't so much how well they performed during the worship service. It was that there was a young man who saw potential in my son and wanted to see him exercise it for the Lord. So he made a way for it to happen. That's what friends do. And because Barnabas, the encourager, Utilize Saul's gifts, the believers in Antioch grew. And they were first known as Christians. Why does that matter? Because they're getting a reputation now. They're getting a reputation. Christians. Saul's teaching had led them to be known now across the world as Little Christ. What a cool title. They were mocking. The world was like, oh, look at this group of little Christ, little Jesus, right? 
and, and, and they meant it as a term, a derogatory term. And the church said, no, that's exactly who we need to be. We need to be little versions of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And they embraced it. Christians were beginning to recognize, be recognized as distinct in Antioch. And it would go on to play a long and key role in the emergence of Christianity. Some historians will even go so far as to refer to Antioch as the cradle of Christianity in the early church. Here's my last thought to you today. Faithful friends make you better for Jesus. Surround yourself with people who make you better for Jesus. They take you deeper in your walk with Him. They take you deeper in your service to Him. I pray that you find that friend. And if you don't have that friend, I pray that you find that friend here. May we be a church that seeks to love on and take people deeper in their walk and their service to the Lord. Church, can we be those people? It's hard work. It's dirty work. It's challenging. People are sheep. You know what it's like to try and push a sheep sometimes? It's darn near impossible. But we must believe the best in everybody else because Christ does. Let's pray.